welcome to The Art of Being Human. We've been talking about personality and the things that affect personality and the study of the personality. So today I thought I would take a segment, and it may even take more than one segment, about if you can uh, understand people on the basis of their color preferences. So this is basically a, uh, a segment on color and how people perceive color. So what I want to do is to go into color, the tests that exist so that you can test the person's color preferences, and then from that, make deductions about what their personality is like. But first, I want to start off with a couple of stories that concern color. And the first story is about a prison in a southwestern state, and it's a male prison, and all of the uniforms, which are usually orange, have been changed to hot pink. So all of the male prisoners have to wear hot pink uniforms instead of the usual orange, and they hate it. They absolutely hate hot pink. Now, I think if it was a female prisoner, the females would say, hey, that's a nice color, that's okay, but not for the men. Men particularly don't like pink, at least not bright pink. So they're complaining about it, they don't like it, but they really don't have a choice. They have to wear the hot pink. And many of the prisoners are saying that they will never get in trouble again. When they are out of prison, they won't do anything that will cause them to go back to prison because they can't stand the thought of wearing hot pink uniforms. So I think maybe something's been, I think that the prison guards are on to something here. Maybe it will help people just to stay away because they don't like the color of their uniforms. But the, there is a second story I want to tell you that I think is very significant in terms of research. Research. And this is a story about a man who is colorblind. Now, a colorblind person can see. This person has perfectly normal intelligence. He can see, but everything he sees are in shades of gray, nothing, or black and white, but nothing in color, all in shades of gray. And so he had a surgery done. And by the way, he's a brilliant person. He's also a very able musician. So he knows a lot about sound, but he just can't see color. So he had a surgery done in the United States. He's not saying where, because this is not government approved, and he's afraid the surgeon would get into trouble. So he's not mentioning any names. But he had a chip put into his body. And with that chip, he wears something, and if you can take a look, <clears throat> I've got my pointer over here. If you can take a look at this uh, little drawing that I made as a part of my notes, it's him wearing a little device around his head. He puts it around his head, and then he has this little thing that sticks out. Now, you have to remember for this story that, of course, sound is wavelengths. We've talked about that before uh, in terms of circadian rhythms and so forth, but color is wavelengths too. And so with this, the chip in his brain and this device on his head, he can pick up the vibrations of color in terms of sound. Now, this is going to sound odd to you, but it is a, it's new research. It's being done a lot in Europe. And what he can do with a device on and the chip in his head, uh, he can actually listen to color. Color makes a sound because it has wavelengths. And with a device that he has on, he can actually hear the sound of color. Now, if you're a sighted person, and most people are, and you can see color, you don't even think about hearing it. But he hears color as long as he's wearing that device on his head. He hears color. So sound has wavelengths. Color has wavelengths. And the man had a chip inserted in his brain, and he wears a device around his head, and it has like an extension. This is just my kind of sketch of it. And the device picks up the wavelengths of the color and produces sound from it. Now, every color has a sound, and the sounds never change. And he has become so skilled at it that if he hears a sound, he can identify the color and know what color he's looking at, even though he can't see it. He is still colorblind. Now, isn't that unusual? He actually can hear color. So 
Uh, he sees in the shades of gray. He does paintings, I'll show you on the next page, a lot of it concentric circles, and each circle is based on the color, the, uh, he hears the tone, he knows the color, and he paints the color because the colors are labeled for him, and then he makes paintings from that. So he has to be wearing his device on his head to hear the tones and hear the color. He doesn't wear it all the time. The chip, of course, is permanent. So when he does, I want to take this down for a second. extra page here. This is an example. I just kind of made this up, but this is an example of what he does. He does artwork in colors. I think he does some in straight lines, too. He looks at a color, and he can't see it. He sees the, he sees the gray, and then he wears that piece on his head, and he gets a tone. By listening to the tone, because he is a skilled musician, he knows what color it is he's looking at. And then he paints it in a circle. And when he gets through his artwork, he has a series of concentric circles. They're all a different color, which he can't see. But the colors have been labeled. The paint has been labeled. And so he is painting these circles according to what he can hear. And what he is, is doing is he's hearing the color. Oh, that's red. And you can see him. He's sitting there, and he's saying, this is red. This one's yellow, and so he paints it. He has a can of yellow paint. It's labeled yellow because he can't see the color. He paints it according to the tones that he's hearing. He can identify color by hearing the tones of color. Now, you have to remember, he still can't see color. He's still colorblind. And he always will be colorblind, but he can identify the color that he's seeing by listening to the tone of it. Now, I think most people don't even give a thought to the fact that it might be possible to hear color, but every color has its own tone. He can hear it with the chip and the device that he wears, and he can paint it, he can talk about it, but he still can't see it. So what's the sense of it? Well, I, it, it, for him, it's emotionally important because it helps him to interact in a world of color, even though he still can't see the color. I know I used to go to meetings at, at, of a district of, with, where I'm a minister, and uh, the man who was in charge couldn't see color. And he would say, now, I know this is pink. Turn to the pink sheet in your booklet. Uh, I know it's pink. I can't see it, but they tell me it's pink, so I know that it's pink. You know, the thing that's, that's so disturbing to me about, about individuals, and uh, I'm compassionate for them, how, how can you describe a color to a person who can't see it? How can you show them this is red, this is green, and these are the differences between them, and they can't see it? All they're doing is seeing a different shade of gray. For that matter, how do you describe a, per, a, a fragrance to a person who can't smell. You know, they're missing a lot. Lilacs are beautiful. They have a wonderful fragrance. Roses are beautiful. They have a wonderful fragrance. How can you discuss fragrance with a person who can never experience it? How do you make it real to them? I'm not sure that you can make it real to them. But they're aware that they're not seeing something. They're aware that there's, there's something different, and they're missing it, and they can't explain it. But it's not there for them. Same with fragrances, or same with people who are tone deaf, and they can't get the differences between tones. You know, it, the, there are deficits that some people have, and it's really too bad because they're missing out on a lot. But this man does paintings like this. I made this one up, but it's similar to what he does. So he does a lot of paintings of circles and large enough to be hung on the wall. These are huge paintings, but they're all from what he has heard, and the color is based upon what he has heard, and he can't see the color. The sad part is that he's never going to be able to see color. But the good part is that with this research, it may open up opportunities. It may open up things and gradually give us enough, co enough insight about color, about wavelengths. That maybe the eye can be bypassed, and a person would be able to see. 
Now there is, and this is an aside, it's not, not really germane to what I'm talking about, but there are some people that are going blind and they have now devised a type of glasses. It doesn't look like, it looks like, I mean, they're very heavy, large, like you would, all you could think of as a scuba lens or something like that. They're that large, but they somehow bypass the way that the, the, uh, call, that the eye sees and they are able to see even though they're going blind. Now they're not seeing a lot, but they're seeing enough that they can walk around the house and do their chores and do things like that and not trip over things. They can find their way around, but, but it's like a black and white images, but they're clear enough that they can make out the people that they see, the things that they do, and it's like bypassing what the normal physiology of the eye is so that, and getting it into the brain because as you know, when you see see anything through your eyes, the eyes bring it to the brain and then the brain twists it upside down because we really do see upside down. So the brain is twisting it in the opposite way and then interprets what it is and that's how we see. So if the eye is blind, it doesn't necessarily mean that the brain would still not be capable of seeing. The brain could be capable of seeing if they can get those images to the brain and bypass the optic nerve. Now, I don't know how those glasses work, but they do work, and people can see with them. Limited, but limited is a whole lot better than nothing. You know, it doesn't take a very bright candle to light up a whole room. And so, they, but they're very expensive. They cost about $15,000, but they do work. And it may be the answer for some people who are blind to be able to see again, at least to be able to function with sight. So let's go on to Kala. <clears throat> Excuse me. The question is, can a person be evaluated at, at, in terms of what they're like, what their personality is like, uh, what their interests are, what their characteristics are, it can it be done on the basis of their color preferences, their own color preferences. If a person likes a certain color, they like blue better than green, they like blue better than red, they like yellow better than orange, and can you test them out and then find out what their color preferences are and how does that affect their personality? It's just something that's important to uh, to, to understand, you know, it gives you an insight as to what the person is like. And can that be done? And I'm, I've got a lot more faith in this than I have in faith in these uh, uh, theories based on body types. We are going to get into that as well in maybe another couple of segments. But I have a lot more faith in the color because there's been an intense amount of research done on it. And a lot of it just seems to work out. So let's go, out with, uh, let's go on with this. Can a person be evaluated in terms of personality characteristics, health, mental health, mental abilities on the basis of their color preferences using nothing but colors? And color is, is easy to use because color is emotional. And color doesn't depend upon your reasoning. So people who have difficulty in talking about things, they have difficulty in, in uh, uh, talking about their emotions, can express things and preferences through color. So it's helpful that way. Colors have a strong emotional impact on people. Advertisers use color to attract customers to buy products. Color and design are used together to get people to buy things. When they try to sell cars to men, they use certain colors. If they want to sell cars to women, they use other colors. Color does have an impact on us. If, uh, if, you, uh, if someone sits in a room that's painted red and they're not doing anything, they're just sitting there, it's just a very casual thing, their blood pressure goes up because of the red color. If someone sits on, in a blue room uh, uh, or something where the walls are painted blue and it's just a casual thing, nothing really is going on, their, blo their blood pressure goes down. So uh, people with a rich fantasy life, children, authors, artists, poets and so forth, they love purples and lavenders and pinks. It seems to go along with the fantasy life that they have. Uh, people with mental illnesses often love green. 
It's not unusual for schizophrenics and other types of major mental illnesses that people love green. And it may well be, now I'm not saying everybody who loves, uh, loves green has a mental or emotional disturbance. I'm not saying that at all. But people who do have emotional dis disturbances seem to be drawn to that color. And it may be symbolic. This is somebody's theory. I can't say whether it's right or wrong. But it may be symbolic of the fact that green represents nature, calmness, grass, leaves, trees, things of nature, and they may be comforted by the color because all of nature, a lot of nature, is actually different shades of green. So somebody has made a theory about that. Women love pastels more than men do. Children and women tend to love pink. Boys uh, and men love blue, but they're more pro but, but they're more prone uh, women are more prone to like pink. Men like to see women dressed in red. Women like to see uh, men dressed in blue. Men and women love uh, the general population loves red, blue, and green as their favorite colors. Brown and orange are the least loved colors, but I, I kind of take issue with that because as I'm watching different shows and I'm involved, you know, just in terms of how people prefer colors just to keep a track on it, I'm finding that many people really love brown. And I think that brown is not an unloved color. Orange, well, that's kind of iffy. Some people like it, some people don't. So brown is getting much more... Um, loved or much more attention. People who love black, I want to talk to you about people who love black. Black is considered to be, you know, a, a difficult color. It's an emotional thing, you know. People who like black are depressed. Not so. Mentally ill people who love black, they, they love black because it means to them death, uh, things like that, death, despair. Uh, however, people who are normal, who love black, really love black, and they wear a lot of black. I've talked to many people who love black, and they will tell me that most of their wardrobe is black. They go to a store, they buy black clothes, they like black. And for these people who wear so much black, because they really wear a lot of it, they will have a little gray or a little white mixed in here and there, but their basic color is black. And they look good in it. They love the color. They look good in it. They wear it a lot. And they're very content, happy people. If you think people that are wearing black all the time, they're, they're discouraged with their life, or they're depressed, or they're in a state of grief, that's not true. People who love black wear an awful lot of black. And at the same time, they love the color. They're drawn to it. They look good in it. They buy most of their clothes in black, but they tend to be very content and very happy people. And they'll tell you, I love black. I wear black all the time. But they're not depressed. They're not morose. So you have to take and, and kind of shed that idea about how bad black is. Um, they look good in black. So I want to make that kind of clear. Many people are color sensitive and they react to color in an unusual way. And their color preferences are innate. Most people who love certain colors, they love certain colors and it's innate within them. They love them and it's a lifelong love of a certain color. But some people love them more, are really color sensitive and react to color. Now there is a test called the Max Lucher test. The Lucher color test was designed in Switzerland by a guy who did a whole lot of work, and I want to discuss that test. And maybe what I should do is do it in the next segment, because I don't have a lot of, of time left. But he has done tons and tons of research on people in their color preferences, and who loves what color and why. And, he, and the test, I've taken it. I've also given it. The test has had enormous amounts of research on it all over the world. And people use this, and they're very excited about this test because it does show a lot. It's a lengthy test. He will show you, like, or if whoever's testing you will show you, like, five shades of blue, and you're 
rate, which is the best color for you, which you like the best, and you rate them, or uh, six colors of orange, different shades of orange, which you, do you like and which don't you like. And by the time it gets through, there are like a hundred colors in that test, at least a hundred. And by the time he shows you the colors over and over again and tests you, then he can get a fair approximation of what kind of a person you are, what likes you have, what dislikes you have, what kinds of, of, of person you are. Are you social? Are you quiet? You know, what kinds of interests you have? And it basically is right on the money. So I want to get into that, and we have very little time left, so I'm going to close it here, and we'll begin with this next time and continue with it. So please join me next time.